Hey, how are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Can't complain. Cool. Before we start, I want to tell you about this story. I don't know if you heard about it. Did I, did I ever tell you about my trip to outer space? Does this have anything to do with cyber harassment? Yes. Uh, okay, tell me. Okay, so this was a little while ago. I visited this place called Alpha World. I don't know if you remember, 3D World. I had never been mm -hmm. there before. And so I go there and this guy approaches me and we're all avatars. So this guy comes over and he asks me if I know how to fly. And I said, no. So he said it was going to teach me. So he showed me how to fly and, you know, I practiced. And then he said, follow me. And he showed me around. So we're flying up into outer space and we flew past, you know, the moon and, you know, whatever, past the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> I remember that. And we landed on <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> For real. And, um, and so we're on Jupiter. And then I'm, you know, looking around and stuff. And, and then he kind of leaps up again like he's going to fly. So, of course, I'm jumping up after him. But he, like, takes off. So I... You know, I'm going after him. I'm trying to talk to him. He won't talk to me. He won't look at me. He won't stop. And then after a while, he's like a little teeny speck and he's gone. And I'm like, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. And I, I couldn't find Earth. I was like in outer space, <laughs> like nothing around me. I was totally lost. So, oh, my wrong. goodness. Alison, is that how you came up with this TV show called Lost in Space? Not funny. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Safer Social Media Show. Here on the Safer Social Media Show, we talk about how we as individuals can gain the ability to take a more critical look at what we see online and become more selective, how we use that information and how that leads to the freedom of disinformation. So in case you don't know, know who I am, I'm your hostess, Brigitte Limbanda. I'm a global goodwill ambassador and a live streaming advocate. I started my career raising awareness about the water crisis in South Africa, and that's how I developed my passion for live streaming. And so I produce and host online shows and lead conversations with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and authors. My amazing co-producer and co-host is Alison Diamond. Alison is a sociologist and social media enthusiast concerned about disinformation and malicious behavior. She likes to focus on finding user-based solutions, and that's how we came up with this show. Alison, welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay. So today, well, I'm, I'm yeah, go person. ahead and t tell it. Yes. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna step on each other once in a while, only because we're so far apart. There's delay. <laughs> There's always a lag. So if I step on you, I do apologize. <laughs> Don't mean it. Um, but yeah, our topic today is um, cyber harassment, cyber bullying. And um, do you want to define it? Well, according to the American Psychological Association, they define it as a form of aggressive behavior in which someone intentionally and repeatedly causes another person injury or discomfort. Okay. So do you think what happened to me in alpha world is, I mean, would you call that cyber harassment? I'd say, yeah. I mean, it comes in different forms. And I think sometimes it is so subtle that mm -hmm. we don't even realize what's happening to us. And I think that's kind of part of the curse that a lot of people um, may not even be able to recognize that they are being bullied on online. Yeah, because, you know, after that was over, 
Um, I mean, I had to like shut down the program to get out of it. And I'm sure that this person probably did that to all sorts of newbies, you know, but I, I mean, it, to me, it was kind of a mean thing to do, but it was also felt kind of mild, you know, but if there were a lot of people like getting together and doing that, that would definitely be an organized, you know, a harassment thing. I, I would, that's how I would feel. Mm. So if, if we were to help people identify, because I think that's a bit of the, the, you know, kind of the tricky part a little bit is how do we identify um, when we are being cyber bullied and what are the different forms in which mm-hmm. cyber bullying can occur um, online? Because it may not be something that's blatantly obvious you know and sometimes it's blatantly obvious to other people but it may not be blatantly obvious to to us so where do we draw the line like where do we draw the line between cyberbullying and teasing what do you think i think there's a fine line um between cyberbullying and teasing because you know teasing is is in jest and and it's not something that upsets you it's not something that um belittles you and i think that to me is is the difference you know there's a difference between taking the mickey out of someone and then intentionally making them feel small or inferior right yeah yeah i I agree um (laughs) and of course technology is failing me i'm going to post the question but the question is just that what is the difference? Where do you draw the line between cyberbullying and um, I'm just looking at my screen here. Are you? Do you think you can post that? Can you see it? The questions um, are. Question. I've got the question cards. Yes. Yes. Would you like I me if to you can post it? Yeah, because my um, the for some reason I think it might be the either the internet or my device, but I'll I'll keep trying to get it on the. Um, in the feed here, but yeah, if you can show it, that would be awesome. Okay. Oh, perfect. Where do we draw the line between online teasing and online bullying? And, um, and my response to that is, yeah, I think um, when it's an individual incident, you may not know that there is some kind of organized bullying going on, but it's being diffused amongst a bunch of people. Um, but yeah, when it's targeted and you, you know, you can tell it's against you, um, whether it's one person or a bunch of people doing it to you, yeah, there, it becomes bullying. But yeah, you're right. I think it can be a little vague sometimes. And it's it's funny how sometimes these things are so well organized. You know, I mean, I, I I've never really gotten behind the psychology of people getting into it, and you probably could speak to that a lot more than me because it's your field. Um, but sometimes you get you know one person that's hell bent on bullying and they seem to target ran people randomly um and other times it's a well organized group of people i know that um currently on facebook for example there's this group called um i don't know what to call them they refer we refer to them as the couch gang so what they'll do is um when you are online and they seem to target creators who are broadcasting so what they'll do is they will gate crash your broadcast and um you know I tr- I'm t- I try and tell as many people about it as possible because if you don't know what's going on um it, you could get blindsided so what they do is they enter your broadcast while you're online and they will say oh I like the couch and you're thinking what couch do I have a couch behind me you know, and and they'll come with all these comments about couches and they'll persist, you know, I'd like to buy your couch. And it'll throw you completely off topic. And that's their big idea is to be able, you know, to throw you off topic. But here's the cinch, the thing that really gets to me a little bit about, and we've spoken about this before, how the platforms need to take some sort of uh, responsibility. Now, in this particular right. case, um, Facebook's response to this is that it's your responsibility as the creator to get rid of these people. And I'm like, it's not my platform. That's your job. (laughs) Yeah, 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 definitely. I I think that there is a lack of support 
from platforms, they have this kind of hands-off mentality where they actually want to distance themselves from third-party content. And, um, and I don't think that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Before we carry on, I want, to, I want to say welcome to everyone who's jo joining us live. Let us know in the comments. Um, I'm based in Cape Town in South Africa and Alison is in the US. So let us know where you are watching from. And uh, if you have questions about the topic that we're engaging with, if you want to, you know, we, we, we've got, I think, seven, que seven questions we'll be talking about. Please feel free to join in and um, share your thoughts. And um, I'm still trying to uh, get this one posted, but you can see it um, right on the uh, screen below us. Where do we draw the line between online teasing and online bullying? Um, we can go on. Um, I really liked your story about the, um, the couch gang because that's an example of an organized group who was set to create, you know, um, chaos and, and to basically interrupt and disrupting for just plain old entertainment. You know, it may seem mild, but there are people who are genuinely running a business, you know, and are really connecting with people. They may be teaching, um, lecturing or what have you, and, and people who are just set to disrupt uh, will come in. I think, um, do you think that uh, Periscope, I think it seems like they have kind of uh, gotten hip to some of this stuff and they are, they will react a little more when you complain. Have you noticed that? Um, yes, Periscope, I have seen a massive shift, like in an earthquake kind of massive shift in Periscope, because it used to be the domain of serious bullying um, yeah. and sexual, you know, sexual harassment was rife on Periscope. Um, That's true. Exploitation of young, young children. I mean, I've seen many of this with my own eyes. I've, I've been witness to this. And Periscope did nothing for a very, very long time. And I think when Twitter bought Periscope, it started getting a lot of pressure from the community. And that is why I'm always on about, um, you know, never feel that you cannot make a difference. Because collectively as a community, as users of social media, we do carry a lot more weight than we think. Yeah, um, and it's important um, when it happens to you, speak up because you may think you're alone and you may find 10 other people, 13, 15 other people, you know, who have gone through the same thing. And then together you could speak out about it. Absolutely. And, you know, if you're unable to, my advice is if you don't feel um, strong enough to speak up, then find a buddy to support you and talk about it. You know, that's yeah. your best bet is, is find someone to be with you, to even physically sit with you when you're making the announcement and saying, look, this is what's going on with me. But don't be don't be silent. You mm -hmm. need to speak up if somebody um, is berating you, is treating you disrespectfully, if someone is calling you stupid online. And, and that's and, I, and that's a great example. You know, it's it's. I could say to you, hey, Alison, don't be stupid. But that is said in jest. That's very different mm -hmm. from me saying to you, hey, stupid. You know, it's, it's, a, right. it's, a, it's, very, it's very, very different. Right. One is you're joking, but the other one, you're trying to silence me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, one of the things that we talk about is how social media platforms may contribute to bullying. And we kind of touched on one of them where there's a lack of response to complaints about bullying. So um, we did talk about Periscope maybe having a little bit of a better response to it. And uh, what do you think about some of the other platforms? Well, before, before I talk about some of the other platforms, I just want to mention that Periscope, for those who don't know and who's using Periscope, um, it's, it, it now has a report button. So if somebody is acti acting inappropriately or it may not even be towards you, they could be acting inappropriately towards someone else. Um, Periscope has now got the ability to report. And so Facebook has got a similar process of reporting content, whether it's um, 
typed content or whether it's visual material. But I do feel that Facebook, with its huge community, needs to do better. The, the mechanism for reporting is clunky. Um, yeah. yeah, it is. It's it complicated. Is. It's too complicated. Yeah. Yeah, we had a topic um, the previous week um, about account takeovers. And there are people who have reported the account takeover to Facebook. And months later, they haven't gotten a response. They haven't gotten it solved. So not all platforms handle these things equally. I see, I've, I've noticed that uh, Periscope, is, well, Periscope and Twitter, I guess you can put in the same bag now because they're owned by the same company. Right. I find that they're um, they're a lot more responsive than Facebook. You know, the turnaround time is a lot faster mm -hmm. um, with Twitter and Periscope than Facebook. The wheels are still turning way too slowly, unless it's something like you know the the massacre that we had in New Zealand a while ago, where there's mm -hmm. uh, international outcry, where there's social pressure from the right. You know the community. There's social. There's pressure from governments, but not everything warrants pressure from governments. And not every not every person in the community will feel harassed by a certain action. In fact, right. they may even find it funny or entertaining. Yeah. Um, at yeah. the expense of someone else. Mm -hmm. So you may be feeling that you know you're being harassed, and someone else may join in and laugh at you and think you know well get a life. So, right. you know, the support may not be there. Um, and so that's very difficult. On LinkedIn, um, I haven't had any issues with LinkedIn, um, but where mm -hmm. I have seen something inappropriate, um, the reporting mechanism, I must say, is very easy. It's kind oh, of a one-click it's kind of a one-click way of reporting inappropriate uh, content. And, of course, on, on, on all social media, you know, if all else fails, you've got the option to block. Almost all the platforms have got that ability to block. So if you really feel that this is a situation that you can't rectify or that the, the, the platform is not assisting you, mm -hmm. then go for the block option. You know, this. But I still feel it depends on – it's not that I'm block happy. Personally, um, it depends on the situation because sometimes you can turn things around. You can turn it on its head because there are ways of yeah. dealing with it. But I'm not afraid to use the block button if I feel threatened enough by the situation. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for – I keep looking down because I'm – uh, posting these uh, questions. So I had to find a new way to do it. And I'm about to post it. But we can move on to the second question because we're actually discussing it now. Okay, let's post question two, um, which is In what ways? See? There we go. My app and social network developers contribute to cyberbullying. So one of them is the way they respond to our reports. Um, what about the ease in which people can immediately make what they say visible to everyone? Because sometimes you might, I mean, there are people who say things in anger and they're naturally inclined to get into back and forth arguments, but what if there was a little delay where you could actually take it back you know it we make it so easy on these different platforms to post but why isn't it easy for us to get rid of them um that is true i think that is something that that could be worked on mm -hmm. um it's very it's very difficult also because you know the one problem I see is the ability to screenshot everything these days. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so even if there were an easy and quick way, you know, in other words, say it gives you 20 seconds or 30 seconds to 
remove something, that's mm-hmm. still enough time for someone to screenshot it and still sure. and still circulate it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you post it, it's going to be in, the, in a server somewhere. So even if, if you delete it, Facebook or whomever could find it, you know, I would imagine that um, it would still be nice to have them delete if they wanted to. There are times when, you know, you might really be sorry that you said something and there's, I mean, we have like and all that stuff. Why not, like we said a couple of weeks ago, have an apology button, you know, or, or something that I guess addresses the problems that social media platforms have helped to create. Uh, somehow we need a way to help you know, decrease those things or reverse them or something. So, I, you know, I do think platforms have a, a responsibility to think of something. I like that idea. Um, you know, we are human and sometimes we say something uh, without thinking or mm-hmm. considering the, the consequences. And I kind of like, because we asked, I think it was last week or the week before, we asked if there's, any button we could add, what would it be? I really like that idea of an apology button. <laughs> I like it too. I, I'm going to vote for the apology button. I hope that other people um, will get in on this. There, it's actually one of the questions that um, that is posted on this um, account. If you go through some of the questions, question of the day or uh, one of those things, there's a question that says if you could add uh, another button, a fourth button to the options in Facebook, what would it be? So if any of you have any ideas, um, you can add your comment at any time. Um, but yeah, I do like the apology button. I could probably use it myself a few times. <laughs> what else? What else? I, I don't hear you anymore. Is that you? Ah, I was I was using the cough but I was using the cough button. Oh. I'm still I'm still trying to get over my flu, you know, so I've still got this residual cough that I'm trying to get rid of and so oh. I use the cough button quite often. You've had that forever. I know, I really am tired. I really want to just feel better and get over this now. Um yeah. what what were we talking about? I got sidetracked with my cough button. Um. I was just wondering if there's anything else um, that platforms could do to, um, you know, kind of help us to quell the bullying or decrease it or report it or something. It, it, I like when I when I see somebody if if the couch gang showed up, what could what would you be able to do with it on on Facebook? Do you know? Um, you can block them. So one way of dealing, one way of dealing with it as a creator, for example, um, is to have a point to ask someone to moderate your comments. So whether mm-hmm. you are streaming on LinkedIn um, or on Twitter, Periscope, Facebook, YouTube, doesn't matter which platform you're on. If you feel that you, and especially I find new creators are tend to be a little bit nervous because they're trying to watch all the moving parts of being attentive to the comments uh, of right. real engagement, um, of using the software that they're using to stream with. So there's quite a few things to focus on. So you could engage the services of a friend and say, you know, could, can you moderate the comments? For me so if any of these you know bullies turn up can you deal with that so I don't have to so that's one way that um, yeah. that you can deal with it and what I, I would like that. to yeah I love that idea because it takes a bit of uh, the heat from you from you you know um, mm-hmm. and just not having to worry about bullies entering and believe it or not even on on LinkedIn it's a thing um, yeah. you know, it's, wow. it baffles my, it baffles my brain that on a professional platform like LinkedIn, people would harass people about stuff like their weights, for example, totally wow. inappropriate, completely inappropriate. Um, you know, very, very cutting and unkind comments um, you cannot believe the level of backbiting that some of the creators on LinkedIn um, are having to 
endure, you know. Um, I mean, a lot of people share inspirational stuff, for example, and some yeah. people will call them out for it and say, you know, you think too much of yourself or, you know, all kinds of unkind things. It's, it's, yeah. it's shocking. Yeah, and I wouldn't have expected that on LinkedIn. I wouldn't have either, but sadly it does exist. And so, you know, what I would say to creators is, expected to happen mm -hmm. because that way if you have a policy of how you're going to deal with it it's your you know when you when you streaming it's your broadcast you can set yeah. the rules and so you can decide i'm not going to tolerate this in my broadcast and i will say you know if you're a bully or what it, you know you're not welcome here Mm -hmm. uh, and just you know, call them out because if you if you see that and you call them out, people watching um, are more likely to respond and jump in and help you if you don't have a moderator. Right. Yeah. And um and I think that's one of the things that we talk about, sort of a buddy system, looking out for people who are being attacked. Um, those are things that we as users have to do because we, have, as we've said before, can't depend on a platform to save us, you know, from each other. We, we um, you know, the, even the tools they provide, which they could provide, are lacking. So definitely we're kind of on our own. And, and again, you know, I'd like to say to people, if you see someone being bullied online, if you notice that, don't be silent. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because if the shoe was on the other foot, you would like to know or think that other people would come to your aid. So don't yeah. ignore it when you see someone you know being harassed online. I think I got question two out. <laughs> 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 so um, it kind of um, leads into question three. I don't know if you can put that up now um, and I'll try to put it up out here too. Um, I've got it. Has, she, she's got it. She has got it going on. So um, question three, what's the biggest argument for or against holding platform developers responsible for cyber harassment that originates from their from their platforms. So if you if you want to argue for holding them responsible, what would you say is your biggest argument? Say you're saying, you know, you're arguing a court case because somebody is suing and somebody is suing Twitter. Um, you know, what would your argument be that Twitter is responsible for this third party content? What do you think for Jesse? My thinking, Alison, is that by virtue of the fact that they own the platform, they become the enabler of whatever is happening on that mm -hmm. platform. Yeah. Um, and so, in my opinion, they definitely must be held accountable. Um, and I know that Facebook, for example, has got this line of reasoning that it's your broadcast and therefore you're responsible. I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. The engagement is happening on their platform. The yeah. cyber bullying is happening on their platform. Um, they've enabled an environment where it's possible to be bullied. Um, yes. That's my take. Yeah, and I think when it comes to safety, um, I mean, people can argue and say, well, you know, would you hold the billboard company responsible when people use it for graffiti? You know, well, you know, that's, that's a public hazard. But I think that, you know, we know that cyber harassment has really deep, um, what's the word I want, um, has a deep impact on people who are bullied and who are victimized by it. And it's, it's not anything to sneeze at. It's, I mean, there are people who are bullied for years and years, people who are stalked, people who are targeted. So it's not something to take lightly. And that's why the platforms need to do something about it, especially when the people, when people can hide, you know, when they can spoof and, um, and hide behind, you know, fake accounts or, you know, what have you. There are so many ways that people can use technology. And so you need experts and you've got to put the resources aside and the platforms need to be doing that. Mm. No, absolutely. So I, I definitely, you know, will not say I, I disagree that they're making it the the user's problem mm -hmm. um, to to manage 
online bullying or cyber harassment of any kind, I disagree that they can pass the buck to the to the users. Now, um, there's a case of a, a political figure in the United States. His name is Devin Nunes, and he mm -hmm. is suing Twitter because there are lots of fake accounts. Like, um, I think there's one called Devin Nunes Cow, Devin Nunes' mm. mother. You know, there and these people are making fun of him, and he's saying that this is harmful to him. They're trying to um, squelch his voice and keep him from you know, running his campaign and um, they're basically disrupting him and making fun of him. He, he thinks Twitter is uh, playing, you know, part and parcel into this. Um, they're responsible, and but he's going further. He's saying that by letting people have these parody accounts, that Twitter is actually supporting these accounts and supporting um, silencing him. Um, what do you think? Um, I think I would say he's got a good case. Um, I, I know of, of someone um, also a very well-known person. His name's Joel Com. I don't think you'll mind me mentioning him by name. But Joel has for the longest time had a problem with people using his image, his, his actual photograph, mm -hmm. and creating fake accounts. In fact, he spends every single day of his life, he spends a portion of his time going through Facebook, finding these people that are using um, his image, not just his image, but also the details of who he is, his profile, and they create these fake accounts. You know, I mean, it's, and, and he's been at it for the longest time. You know, ever since I've known Joel, he's, he was talking about, um, this problem that he has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, we've kind of made a case uh, for holding them responsible. What is the case that Twitter might make against holding them responsible? I can come up with one, which is the law, at least in the United States, that was created to protect um, internet platforms from taking responsibility. Uh, for these third party actions. So all these platforms can kind of hide behind that legislation, which was made, of course, well before social media, but um, but they actually have legal protection. Um, so I guess that would be something that they'd say, we're protected from this. What do you think about that argument? Well, I think, you know, some laws need to be revisited and maybe this case now um, against Twitter is going to provide the opportunity to revisit the law. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I think it'll become a test case. And um, and as you said, you you mentioned something very valid here, is that a lot of these laws were written years ago prior to the social media scenario that we now have. Right. Yeah. And we have to be flexible and change with the times. If something is allowing, um, you know, malicious actors to harm people, then you might need to rethink, you know, what the platform is allowing people to do and the policies, you know, that, that let them get away with it. So, yeah, I do believe there well, is some responsibility. I think, you know, it's pretty much the same as when you end up working in a company um, and you being harassed. Mm -hmm. um, and your HR department is aware of the harassment and they do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it means that they've created that enabling environment for this in which to flourish. And I don't think yeah. it's any different yeah. on the social media platforms. You know, it's an mm -hmm. enabling environment. Right. And you know what? That is, um, that's actually a good analogy, you know, because we're sharing the same space. We're encountering each other and people are using that opportunity to harass, to bully, to, you know, silence or threaten. And yeah, I think it makes a good, it makes a good analogy. I like that. Um, and I think that it would be hard for anyone to fight against it. I mean, they can't say that I'm the HR department, but that's not my area. You guys are adults, <laughs> you know, that wouldn't work. 
So um, it, I yeah. don't think that'll fly in the court of law. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> well, um, let's keep it moving. Hopefully, we'll get some more feedback um, from people over the course of the week. Um, and if they uh, feedback today, I'm not seeing it on Twitter, um, but I know we're on other platforms that we'll be looking at as well. Um, but question number four, um, we are kind of uh, segueing um, into another topic about online and offline resources. Um, one of the online resources uh, is all of us. You know, when we see bullying happening, we as the users should become a friendly resource to the victim. That's that's my belief. You know, in an ideal world, that should work. But unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. Not everyone thinks the way you and I do. And the big issue I have with that is Unfortunately, you have this band of people when they see someone treating someone badly, they have the mindset that this gives them the permission to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I see that a lot. Um, I belong to some Facebook groups and the topics couldn't be more average and mundane, like all of us get together because we love a certain TV show. And it's amazing how somebody could say something and then somebody else takes it as, you know, a sign that they're stupid or um, what, what have you, but they'll make that statement and then the other person might respond and then all of a sudden you've got people piling on on both sides, you know, and it's, it's so unnecessary. You know, it, it doesn't advance the conversation. It doesn't create a sense of community. It isn't even about the topic, you know, of the group, but people seem to have this idea. I, I don't know. It's almost like kids on a playground or Lord of the Flies or something, you know, like without a monitor, we just, I don't know, we can disintegrate or devolve, you know, pretty easily. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't get it. You know, I fail to understand what people's thinking is um, around that. And again, I think we just, we did cover this in the last, over the last few weeks. Um, you know, these people are the keyboard warriors out there, the people that um, aren't savvy enough to realize that a pseudonym or whatever it is they're using, um, and if they're using a picture of their dog or their cat, or they've stolen someone's picture, heaven forbid, um, it doesn't give them protection. They're not hidden. You know, people seem to have this idea that if they're using a fake picture and a fake name, that it offers them protection from being mm -hmm. found. It couldn't be furthest from the truth. You know, there is no such thing. And I think if we start talking about that a lot more often and start getting it into people's minds, um, mm -hmm that they need to adjust their mindset about thinking that they are invisible. I mean, I, I know people, unfortunately, um, that behave very badly on social media, very, very badly. Um, mm -hmm. And they believe that it's okay because they're not using their real name. <laughs> right. But why aren't they using their real name? <laughs> It beats me. It really does. <laughs> because they feel they feel it, it gives them a sense of uh, armor yeah. in their minds, you know, that it somehow gives them this bulletproof armor and allows them to just randomly let rip the bullets yeah. of fire yeah. on other people because they think that they are protected. Right. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the idea? I mean, I know that at least in this country, um, I think there's a section of the FBI um, which uh, researches cases of cyberbullying. I don't know what the criteria is for them to jump on board. Um, mm. But what do you think of the idea of some kind of governing body whose job it is to just do that 
and they're associated with all the platforms, something that, you know, we all know about, like the FBI thing. I don't know that people even really know that that exists. Why is it secretive or is it just not, I, I, I don't know, but what if we had a known body and we send our cases there? I, I would personally be pro such a thing myself because mm -hmm. I believe, you know, the greater majority of people are defenseless. They have no way of protecting themselves. And I think especially because we live in an age where um, access to the internet starts at a very, very low level, you know, very young age. Um, yeah. and, and very often, sometimes they do it with their parents' permission and sometimes not. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a known thing that a kid will tell, parents will say, well, you're not allowed to have a Facebook account, you know. And parents will say, well, my kid's okay, you know, my kids are not allowed to have Facebook accounts. But guess mm -hmm. what? More than likely, your kid has got two or three Facebook accounts right. that you have no idea even exists because right. how do you stop it? Mm -hmm. You know? Right. And there's no way for the platforms to stop it. If I were, you know, 10 years old, who's going to know? How's Facebook going to know that I'm really not 13 or whatever their limit is? There, there's no way. I could easily lie. Um, YouTube is very common for children, very young children, to be online without their parents' knowledge, and they're making videos without their parents' knowledge. You know, I mean, it's kind of scary. It does happen. In fact, um, I don't know if I don't know if you know Mari Smith. Mm -mm. Okay, Mari Smith is very well known in social media. She's affectionately known as the Queen of Facebook. Um, <laughs> And Are you talking Mari, about no, Mari, Mari Smith. Mari, okay. Yeah, Mari Smith. She's known as the queen of Facebook. Um, okay. So she asked on Twitter the other day. Okay, either you froze or I froze, but I'm Sorry, moving. I <laughs> you froze. I accidentally hit my my uh, my cough button again. My my microphone. <laughs> so so Mari was asking the other day if there's one thing you would like Facebook in particular to to change, and my immediate response, without even thinking, was for them to institute a way in which to vet people to verify to pre to prevent people from opening to prevent children from opening accounts without their parents um knowledge so some yeah. means verification so you can't have these duplicate accounts and fake accounts with names that don't even exist i mean sometimes you look at these uh, you know i get tons of friend requests on facebook and sometimes you look at these names and yes it'll be I mean, Facebook's criteria is that you have a name and a surname. But it won't vet if you call yourself John Doe, for example. It's a name and it's a surname. You know, well, there's, there's no way sorry, of there's kind a of... phone ringing. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell anyone. We won't tell anyone. Thank no. you. <laughs> <laughs> so so basically they've got no way of vetting that if I call myself Jane Doe, you know, I've got a name and a surname and that's all they care about. Um right. there's no way of verifying that I am actually Jane Doe. Do you think that, you know, like we have a social security number and I don't know what they use in South Africa, but something similar. Do you think maybe we would uh develop maybe a secondary set of numbers, our internet ID or something? Do you think something like that would work or would it be really, really scary? I think if we were to use our real social security numbers and ID numbers, that would be too much, too much information <laughs> in the hands of the social media giants who already own, have too much information um, on us. And that's another topic we should a, discuss one day. Yes. We must put that on our list. A specific one. This is a specific one that's associated I, with your name. 
An identifier, some some sort of identifier, yes. Yeah. I'm I'm very much for that, yes. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be associated with your name and your social security number and your address. I could be, you know, World Harmony, which is my other Twitter account, and World Harmony would have an ID number. And when I log in to a website, they're going to say, what is your ID number? Yeah. So even if I have a, so, a bunch of different names, maybe the same ID number has to follow me. And then if I friend you, if I try to friend you, you could look up that number and see a history of my tweets, history of, you know, whatever. I don't know. I, mean, if, I don't know if that's creepy or not, but I do that now. When people try to friend me, I look at what they do online. And if I don't like it, I'll ignore you. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I do that as well. You know, I mean, Google is my friend. <laughs> Ooh, I hate <laughs> yeah. saying this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean when I say Google is yeah. my friend. You know, if somebody yeah. sends you a friend request, go and check them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would um, recommend that anyway. I, you wouldn't believe how many very strange accounts will try to friend you on Facebook. And when you look at their account, it's just, uh, for women, it's usually a guy, you know, maybe in a military uniform or a business suit, you know, looking official. And then when you look, all of the guy's friends are women. Like they're just collecting women, you know? And I, I don't know what it's like for men. Maybe a, a guy could uh, tell us what the experience like. Do they get a bunch of women with like no affiliation <laughs> to anyone, just uh, with a collecting men on Facebook. It's just very strange. And I would not accept people like that. Oh, she's got her uh, cough button on. Yeah, it's a, it's a very <laughs> awkward situation. And strangely enough, you know, you even get these creepy people on, on LinkedIn. Again, you do get these creepy people on LinkedIn. Um, hmm. Or you get people who, you know, I don't know, but you, you will notice that they're not there for real engagement. You know, they will exactly. inject they will inject comments that completely do not relate to the topic under discussion, you know, yeah. or they'll inject and it, that's what's blatantly an advertisement or something, mm -hmm. um, you know, so they're not there for the bona fide engagement. Um, right. They're there for whatever purpose they're there for. Yeah. So sometimes just using the platform as a resource can help you. Um, I've been in, groups where somebody will mention something like in one group they were talking about um, language and they were talking about gender uh, and how we have you know different names for for gender and we're acknowledging gender fluidity and all that and so should we keep using he and she should we go to they and somebody made a comment well why would you do that what's the need of not acknowledging somebody's gender and just the way they said it it sounded more political than about a discussion of language. And sure enough, I looked at the Facebook page and that person knew about language and had complained about it and was anti, you know, transgender issues and all of that. So sometimes just looking at somebody's page can help you know whether that person is worth engaging with or not. Yeah, so just do a little bit of homework and it's not that difficult. It, it no. really is not that difficult. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to question okay. five? Yes, I'm going to post it now, and I'm sure you're going to beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, she beat me. <laughs> All right, so how can we best support an adult? And this is about adult cyberbullying, because kid yeah. cyberbullying is a whole different world. But how can we best support an adult we witness being bullied? And you I'm know, there, there are some adults who can handle it well, very well. They can take care of themselves. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But that is not true for every single um, adult out there. Um, there is, sadly, um, people who have been cyber bullied adults to the point where they've taken their own lives and it's because yeah. others did not come, speak up in support um, of them and yeah. you know I, I for one um, don't know if I could 
forgive myself if I became a silent participant in someone else being bullied online. Um, do, what do you do when you see it happening? Alison, I'm going to say it depends. It depends on the situation. You know, it depends what the context is. It depends on who the person is that's being bullied. Mm -hmm. um, and who else is in that conversation. So I, don't, I won't say my, I don't have a standard reaction, but I will react. Even yeah. if that reaction is contacting the person privately after the fact to say, are you okay? I actually noticed what happened to you and mm -hmm. I disagree with it. I'd like to support you. You know, I'm 100% on your side. And very often yeah. that's all the person needs is just for mm -hmm. someone else to validate what has happened to them and just know that someone's got their back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am totally um, someone who would promote that approach. You don't have to jump into the argument and be part of it and make it worse. Um, just going into the background and you know, and, and patting that person on the back, you know, virtually and, um, and letting them know, like, like Brigetti said, I have personally done that. And, um, and I've gotten into really nice conversations with people, you know, because they, it was just nice to have a friendly person and, and to validate what you're going through. I think that's a very strong um, and very uh, necessary thing to do because you can kind of think, well, maybe I'm being too sensitive or why are they attacking me and nobody else? It must be me. You know, and then it's really good for somebody else to say, you know what, that is unacceptable behavior. And, you know, it's a, just don't take it personally and blah, blah, blah. Kind of remind you, bring it back to earth. Um, now, do you ever approach the bully? Um, I, I have on occasion, you know, um, and because sometimes, depending on the situation, just calling them out for what they are doing. Um, mm -hmm very often you know they kind of like you do catch them on the back foot because they don't or maybe they're not used to somebody calling them out and yeah. sometimes they will apologize you know because they've they're not used to being challenged maybe yeah. they've just got yeah. a long you know away with it for too long sure and sometimes people don't realize how harsh they sound i i know i've written things um, like when I see somebody posting fake news and I've tried to let them know they posted it, I'll look at it later and think, oh, that sounded a little bit harsh, you know. And so it's good if somebody else would come to me in the background to say, you know what, <laughs> it might be if you change your approach, you know, people might not have reacted the way they did. So it's kind of good. I think you could approach the, bu the bully as well behind the scenes, you know, depending on what kind of bullying they're doing and say, um, hey, I hear what you're saying. In fact, I, I did that. I was in a, a spirituality group, and there was a person there who was having a hard time with the perspective and really going after people for feeling that they were fake and they were, you know, not being authentic. They were too caught up in, you know, promoting the religion or the, or the spirituality, the perspective, without even truly understanding it themselves. And I understood where she was coming from, but everybody else that she responded to, because she was so harsh, um, they, of course, took it, you know, as being attacked. And I approached her behind the scenes and I said, hey, you know, I totally understand where you're coming from and I um, actually agree with you. I think that your approach is causing people to not hear your message, you know, and sometimes that's what people need to hear. And, you know, sometimes people, even a bully, would appreciate the correction not in a public space. Yes. And yeah. very often you can actually win that person over by contacting them privately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that people bully is often because they were bullied. And now this is their chance to feel like they're on top. And, um, you know, sometimes just letting them know that you're connecting with them can kind of, you know, I always think of Caesar Milan. I don't know if you know him, but he's the dog whisperer. He's had this TV show for a while. And the way that he trains the dogs, he has these certain things that he does to kind of bring them back to reality. And that's what I feel like we're doing. You know, we go behind the scenes and we're like, <laughs> and then they remember, oh, I don't have to act like this. Oh, it's, you know, I was, I was really in the red zone and, and okay, I'm okay now. You know, I, 
I, I think that we can be helpful to one another in that way behind the scenes. And then the other thing also just to mention, you know, we spoke earlier about um, how when you post something and you retrospectively think, well, maybe I should not have posted that online and being able to take it back. And we talked about how easy it is to screenshot things in two seconds. It's all it takes yeah. To, yeah. to screenshot something. But if you see somebody being harassed, like in a motor car accident, you know, if you witness an accident of any kind, you want to be able to take a picture of that incident. And so mm -hmm. if you see someone being harassed online, you want to also take a snapshot of that incident so that you can support the person being harassed. Yeah, and um, that's really good advice because a lot of mm -hmm. platforms could say, hey, you know, it's really hard to find this stuff and, you know, and, and it becomes a, a way of delaying the response. And um, I think if you do everything you can at the outset, time, date, or what have you, the screenshot, um, at least you have a, a little bit of a better <clears throat> chance of, you know, uh, maybe putting off or shortening any kind of delays. Yeah, I, I totally think. agree. <laughs> Should we move on to question? Should we move on to question six? Yes, I was hoping I would beat you to it, but I have a feeling. I think we, I think up. we kind of covered it. Um, yeah, we did, didn't we? <laughs> um, I'm gonna post it anyway, and um, maybe people who have some different ideas can um, add to that. But if you want, do you want to go on to question seven? Um, I think just maybe one thing that I wanted to mention on question six um, okay. because now we're talking about if your friend or somebody that you know is engaging in cyberbullying um, oh yeah that is important. you do want yeah you do want to approach the person and let them know that you think because sometimes they may not even be aware of it as you mentioned earlier they may not be aware of which they are coming across um, yeah. And if you screenshot it and say to him, look, that's how you said it, and this is how people responded, um, could you maybe have reframed the way you said it mm -hmm. so that it, it was open to less interpretation of being confrontational or objectionable right. or something? Yeah. I think it's hard if the person who's – being different online doesn't present that way to their friends. Sometimes people do have kind of a secret life, you know? And oh, it's, it's... yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've, yeah, I, I've seen that, you know, you sometimes see people post stuff and you think, who are you? That's not the person that I know in, in real life, you know? And that's mm -hmm. kind of that where people come up with this double or dual, dual persona. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's not what you really want to be on social media. Uh, if you're talking, if you really want to engage a community, if you're really serious about doing business online, for example, and uh, being authentic, you want to be really careful in that area. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you sneaked ahead and put question seven <laughs> up, so I'm going to do it too. <laughs> Darn it! One day I'm going to do it faster than you do. So question seven, imagine that you actually have Zuckerberg's or Jack Dorsey's ear and um, and you get to tell them what you want them to do about cyberbullying. What would you tell them? Let's start with, uh, let's, let's start with Facebook. I would like to tell Mark Zuckerberg that he needs to make it a lot easier to report and then be fast on the button in terms of responding. Um, the reporting mechanisms are too clunky and their response time is way too lengthy, way too lengthy, um, especially in the case of, of cyberbullying, um, you know, because things can escalate so rapidly, so quickly. And if their response time is months, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's just too long. It's way yeah. too long. Yeah, I um, I totally agree. Um, I also think that a lot of the cyber bullying starts with these accounts that those suspicious accounts that uh, you know have people uh, just that like that single 
picture of, of the, you know, a profile picture, and that's all they have repeatedly. They don't post anything, but they have all these friends that they're collecting. Facebook should recognize that this is a pattern and question those people, you know? And uh, I think that would help because there are certain patterns, you know, as sociologists, we see um, that, that people behave in, in certain patterns, like a whole group of people tend to display certain traits and certain behaviors um, that Facebook could be tracking or social media platforms could be tracking. And they could say, you know what, mm-hmm. we've seen two or three markers here that suggest that this person may, you know, blah, 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 may, may be, it just may be a fake account or what have you. But um, I mean, that was just broadly stated, but I think that it's worth it for the platforms to do that. And they probably do in some way, shape or form, but I don't get the impression that there is this, you know, group of people that are dedicated to doing just that and they're here to respond to you. And I, I, I agree with you. We need to see that. We need to see evidence that they care. There's just no sense of uh, urgency. There doesn't nope. seem to be an urgency about it. It's like, you know, not at all. yeah, well, it's in file 13. We'll get to it, you know, one day. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what? This change that Zuckerberg is talking about, moving to uh, end-to-end encryption, which basically means that they won't be able to see what people post, I I think that's why we're not seeing real engagement from Facebook in dealing with uh, abuse and account takeovers and all that stuff while they're taking so long, because this is where their energy is going. And when we get to that point, they can really say, you know what? We don't even see it. Take care of it yourself. You know, that's, that's kind of how I feel. You know, they don't want to be involved. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a whole lot of reneging of, of, of responsibility. You know, it's like, it's not my problem, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about Twitter? Twitter's like a um, different type of engagement. As I said before, I think, you know, they are a lot more responsive. Um, but they could be a lot faster, too. And and the reason they need to be a lot faster is because of the rapid pace of posts on Twitter. Because it's you know, yeah. I mean, the turnover is just mind-boggling. You know, tweets fly past you every second. Um, yeah. And it's so, amazing. because of the nature of their platform, they need to be a lot faster in responding to cyberbullying or bullying of any kind or harassment. Yeah, um, I know that they, I think they said they have a 24, I have to go revisit the policy, but um, there is this one post where a woman made these horrible racist statements. And over the course of 48 hours, thousands and thousands of people had piled on. Um, and actually it wasn't to also be racist, it was to say, wow, I can't believe you posted that. And then a whole bunch of people over the course of the day said, reported it, reported it, reported it. But the 24 hours went by and it was still up. And then, you know, I mean, it just went, it went on and on. And I reported it to Twitter a couple of times, you know, and I was just amazed. I don't know if it's just so difficult. Are they not getting a report? Do they have so many reports that, you know, they'll, they'll get to it when they get to it? I don't know but it stayed up there well past their own policy. And um, even though there are thousands, literally thousands and thousands of people um, at this point reporting and, um, you know, complaining and it was sad. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. I think we basically covered our questions for today. Yep, I agree. And uh, (laughs) what I'm hoping is that, well, we're not going to say what next week's show is going to be. I think we'll make it a little bit of a surprise. Um, but I think it'll be fun. And then, uh, but I, but between now and then, feel free to answer the questions and uh, contribute to the conversation. And you never know if your comment will be on our Twit show or podcast, because we're doing both. This The audio from this will be on our podcast. So we're happy to acknowledge um anybody who is involved in our conversations. And I do want to give a shout out to um, tweeting Talia. Um, I don't see her right now, but she's been really supportive of, um, of safer social media. And she's a great person to know. 
Fantastic. And I want to just give a shout out to our LinkedIn audience um, who has joined us as well. Thank you, LinkedIn. Hi. Really appreciate that you have um, supported us on the show. And if you have any comments, please do let us know. We'd be happy to pick them up again next week. And if you have any other issue that you'd like us to cover in the show um, about making uh, social media a safer place for all of us, because we all benefit from it, um, leave that in the comments as well, and we'll add it to our list of topics. You know, let us know yes, what fine. what interests you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Allison everyone. Las Vegas. And from me, Brigetti Limbanda in Cape Town, it's goodbye, and we'll see you next week, same time, same place. And stay safe. <laughs> yes. On behalf of the flight crew, thank you for flying with us and have a pleasant day.